started out doing compliance and RECRA, but I was in the underground tech program, and I've been involved uh, at the Office of Pollution Prevention since 1997, so I was very glad to move to that program to me. It makes sense to not generate it and not have to worry about it at the end. So anyway, we're a small office. We try to get done what we can uh, do with our staff. I'm going to more talk about, I'm not going to talk about much about money, I'm going to more talk about the Illinois EPA's role in, in the life management of hazardous products that contain hazardous materials like mercury or wet, um, that kind of thing. So I, I'm sure you all know this, but I'm just going to do a little brief history that, you know, hazardous material containment laws first started out in the late 60s, early 70s, and it was PCBs, asbestos, and lead based paint. It was banned, you know, banned from using that or banned from disposing of them. And the next was lead acid batteries and white goods. And through all this time, all, as you know, all the, uh, the costs of managing those wastes have been on the uh, local governments, the landfills, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so finally, in the late 90s, people started thinking, well, maybe the people that make this stuff should be um, taken care of for helping with. The managing the end of it. Part of the goal for that, the reason for that was thought if they have to be involved in managing the hazardous materials at the end of their life, maybe they can change their product designs a bit. And we have seen a little bit of the back mercury containing products, but um, overall, I think we could do more in that area. Um, so, this is the kind of the evolution of programs uh, as I see it. First, you know, the late 80s, <clears throat> started looking at household hazardous waste programs and let's help people get rid of their nasty stuff. And still, that was in you know, all the state and local governments to pay for those, usually. In 1994, Minnesota, well, in fact, a house, a lot of household hazardous waste is not banned from landfill disposal, it comes from a household. So, so then, in the mid-90s, states other than Illinois started looking at maybe even if it's coming from a household, Products. So, uh, from disposal, so Minnesota was the first one that I'm aware of to have a disposal ban that included uh, household products and it was fluorescent lamps. Um, and now it's become more evolved through time, and pretty much all the northern states ban mercury containing products from, uh, that are from households being disposed in those states. And of course, they're banned under hazardous waste laws for the, for the businesses. And uh, we are going from Minnesota um, in 1994 to, to kind of starting the products division type work. There's 24 states now that have the ban uh, some kind of refrigerated product just from being sold and used or sold in that state. And then 24 states also have electronic waste and waste laws. So let's pick it up. Pick it up, Steve. There's always going to be some states that aren't going to do it like Texas. <coughs> They're going to do whatever they want to do, but, but you know, more and more states are becoming progressive, and it's, and it's good to see. So, so now we ban the products from use. Well, what are we going to do with the stuff and get rid of? It's still dependent upon the local governments and state government to fund a lot of these programs. So, they started back in the Northeast, they kind of led this, this uh, charge of finding manufacturers of the products to be responsible for managing those products and then Life. Um, and this is consumer products, some consumer products, and then uh, products for use in industry and businesses. Um, so, all the Northeast states, and that includes New York, the New England states and New York, <coughs> all of them have mercury product laws that require manufacturers to be responsible for um, some kind of law for manufacturers to be responsible for. And they also, they, they led the charge to the state laws on making mercury, um, mercury containing products, and an ideal mostly mercury containing products, and mercury containing products are really the, the most <coughs> widely banned products. So that's, it's been a lot of stuff that relate to that, but I'm going to tell you about it, it relate to other ways. <coughs> so the state laws that they, they, they developed in, um, back in the, the late 90s, first, you know, 
the states need to know who's making the uh, products that contain materials and what products are they making. So they have to do notification. We might be sells a mercury containing product in those more these states. And um, I think in Washington State also, they have to notify those states of what mercury containing products they sell, how many they sell. And actually, <coughs> if they sell them less, they may have to report how much they sell in the US. So we have this database now of where um, we take the products that have sold because we have historical data from 2001 that can show us the amount of produce has been produced. Um, the states went together and formed a clearinghouse, so they don't individually have to do that. Um, and for electronics, most of the states require the manufacturers to register with them, so that's usually it's with the state um, itself. But there, there was a clearinghouse on that pulls the information. I'm not sure I don't deal with that if um, so I think two states, Maine and Washington may require reporting to that too. I'm not sure. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about broad schools bands. Can I get Rhode Island and Louisiana all banned in your mercury containing product? Or I should say banned mercury containing products based on the content and not mercury in that product. So it's pretty much all mercury containing products that includes um, like lab reagents, you know, compounds, that means products and compounds. So, um, so they have such a broad range of products um, that they they require to I'm sorry to be um, <laughs> to be managed. And um, in Illinois, and Maine, we require products that have received an exemption. If it, if it, Manufacturers thinks their if manufacturer thinks their product is beneficial to more beneficial to human health and the environment than an alternative, and they have a collection system that we may approve them to sell those products in the state. Um, and the manufacturers are required to have those systems. They have to tell us who's going to fund it, how they're going to um, get the materials back, and that kind of thing. And a lot of them, for most of our programs, do their reverse So the notification of labeling, I think we're going to discuss this a little bit. Um, <coughs> in the uh, um, notification of labeling, I already talked about the notification, but product labeling in 11 states where in, in which we're going to take products are sold have to be labeled um, as to being <coughs> Some states with mercury content, some of them are used to these. It has to say it contains mercury or have the you know, disposal sign. And you'll see those on fluorescent lamps. A lot, a lot of labelings, just, we see it too because it's station one kind of thing. So um, it has to be clearly visible at the time of purchase too, so the consumer knows they're getting something that contains mercury. And then uh, talk a little about disposal bands. And uh, in Illinois, in most states, it's sort of white goods. And that addresses the, the mercury switches that are in them, as well as Freon, and there's potentially some PCBs in white goods. So um, those are required to be, those hazardous products are required to be removed from white goods before they're recycled. And I hear in uh, the Quad Cities area that Illinois is a lot less strict than Iowa, so you'll see truckloads of white goods coming from Iowa because they don't go to part. The land goods are not fully really about requiring these products to be part of the production. So, um, why, is that? why is that? It's hard for me, hard for the state agency to focus on the Sorry, sitting in the back, I didn't hear oh, that sorry. explanation. Um, the reason why Illinois is 
probably the reason why it's not as diligent in Illinois is the enforcement is lacking, and that's one is it's probably not a real high priority just because of funding, but then also um, we would have to be there, the salt waste agency or the, the state would have to be there when the materials are dropped off to see that they were dropped off to catch the person that did it. Um, or we could also look at the materials, you know, when they've, if they've already been dropped off to see if those materials have been removed. But it's not a continuous waste stream, so our chances of being there, you know, when something's dropped off or something's still waiting to be processed are, are pretty similar. That's, that's the case with a lot of these types of laws is, you know, there's bans and prohibitions, but if we're not there, we can't, can't regulate it. Um, electronic equipment and mercury auto switches, and if you were in the previous, or I'm sorry, the auto session, I'm an auto select person to talk, I will talk about, so yeah, there'll be questions about that too, but auto switches, um, Vehicles without mercury auto switches in them are not allowed to be, certain auto switches are not allowed to be uh, recycled. I'm oh, sorry. Crushed before they're recycled. So uh, the mercury switches have to be removed from that. Uh, electronics roll over the disposal band of that. And then in Illinois, if a product, if a manufacturer has received an exemption to sell a mercury product in Illinois, they also have to have a collection plan to recover those products that they can sell. Uh, in thermostats, there is a specific, there's the Mercury Thermostat Collection Act, there's a specific landfill ban in there, so disposal ban, knowing we dispose of the salt waste and kind of citations, so, um, so we do ban those. And then, um, talk about manufacturing and life programs, and this is kind of the gist of what I want to talk about to get there. Is in most cases, manufacturers are required, required to send a plan to the states. Um, some states approve the plans or are required to approve the plans. In, Il in Illinois, we tend not to do that because these laws are passed through legislation, not by rule. And then they have to go through and make a whole other rule for how to evaluate these plans. So we just put specific things that have to be in that plan. And then we get the collection to where the electronic waste. Um, with thermostats, this past year, the, the manufacturer's um, collection <coughs> program should have, they should have collected 15,000 thermostats, but they didn't, they only collected 13,000. So we do have a mechanism to, we can't enforce against them if they don't meet that goal, the thermostat manufacturers, but we can require them to come back and approve the plan for what we can, they don't get the bill in certain years. So 2012 was the this year. So if we don't need the 50,000 first act collection bill this year, then they'll have to go back and do their plan. We did a plan. We can require them to do incentives um, to incentivize 